There's no secret, there's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent, be still, and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't gonna happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell Podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio with the one and only Dr. Mario Martinez. Mario, how are you, my brother? Doing well, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, the weather's been great, so I'm, I'm very happy. That's awesome. So you guys, uh, longtime watchers, followers, fans, audience members of the Jay Campbell Podcast ha- are familiar with uh, Dr. Martinez's work. Uh, he is the guy who has studied centenarians and you know people who live the longest in the blue zones around the world he came on and we had a profound discussion on that but today he's actually going to share much more for you guys that don't know who he is let me give you a little bit about his bio he is a clinical neuropsychologist who founded the biocognitive science institute in 1998 he has developed the theory of mind body culture which he calls biocognition which suggests how cognition and biology co-emerge with their cultural history in a bioinformational field that seeks maximum contextual relevance. His theory of biocognitive science is based on research that demonstrates how thoughts and their biological expression co-emerge within a cultural history. Academic science continues to divide mind and body as well as ignore the influence of cultural contexts on the process of health, illness, and aging. For example, cultures that support growing older as a positive development associated with increased wisdom and abilities, which I would say is the indigenous uh, have higher numbers of centenarians living healthier lives than cultures that view aging as a process of inevitable deterioration. So again, it's an honor to have you here today. Um, as I've been doing, Mario, recently with some of my guests, and by the way, today for everyone watching is Thursday, June 30th. So we, we have the second half of 2022 to uh, look forward to, you know, depending on your perspective. Can you just give me your, you know, analysis, maybe a high level summary of what has happened to the planet in the last, say, two and a half years and where you see us going? We, the the beauty of of looking at history and looking at anthropology is that things are cyclical. We have, for example, some uh, political changes and we have COVID, but there, there are some archetypal processes that go on. Sure. So to bring it down to a, to a level of being able to be precise about it, what's happened is that COVID forced us to go from the forest to the cave. It did that. And if you're not aware that we have 150,000 years of cave consciousness, then you go in and it becomes a problem. You, you feel deprived. Some people get very depressed. Um, so, but if you're aware of it, and I'll tell you what I did, I thought, okay, We have to go to the caves. I did a lot of my work, as you know, traveling, and I couldn't travel anymore, so then Zoom came on. So then what is is the consciousness that keeps a person healthy in a cave as opposed to out in the forest? Well, number one, one of the things, one of the biosymbolic things that allows a person to to feel safe is fire. Because fire was a very important ritual. You you had fire at the end of the day and and you cooked and and kept the uh, animals away. So what did I do? I thought, okay, I bring fire. Every single night I would have a a candlelit dinner. That has epigenetic memory of safety and and connections. And so that was just one of the things. After that, I thought, okay, what are the things that I can do without now that I'm in this cave? Well, I could do without a lot of traveling. So now that I'm out of the cave, 80% of my work is online. So if you look at it that way, what you have to do is you have to go back and say, what, what kind of epigenetic history do I have? And I, I'll explain epigenetics in a while, sure. but what, what is it that I have as a homo sapien that tells me what I can do in a cave and what I can do in the forest? Now, the mistake is that when you go out to the forest again, you go back to the old things that didn't work, that should have given up. Right. The emotional vampires. This is why a lot of people have quit their jobs without having a, a job because they realize that, that the job didn't have any meaning. Right. And one of the things that happens psychologically when you get stressed out, when you get some catastrophe or something going on, is that you go existentially, you either go into drugs 
or you go into meaning. So if you go into meaning and say, okay, now what, what matters in my life now that I'm threatened here? And a lot of people realize that they have jobs that had no meaning for them and they quit them. So you don't want to be drastic that way, but what you want to do is you want to go back and say, what, what now that I'm in the cave that I don't have a lot to do, I can't go out to restaurants, I can't do the usual things, what has meaning for me? And you might find that a lot of things have meaning for you or that you would living a meaningless life. And those things, that's how I look at it from any kind of catastrophe that comes on or, or turbulence. Beautiful. I mean, you're, you're, you're a man of very surgically precise words. I mean, I, I wrote that down, forced us from the forest to the cave. Uh, this is beautiful. Uh, okay, so let's talk about what you're really here to talk about today, which is, you know, your theory and just what you've learned about, you know, the understanding and the awareness that we have to look to our elders for wisdom. Um, you know, your first point that we have here is how cultural beliefs affect health, relationships, and longevity. Can you kind of just, you know, expound on that? Yes. Um, well, first, uh, I bring a lot, as you know, a lot of anthropology in, but it's sure. really important to to define terms because cu culture could mean many, many things. But the way okay. that I define culture in an anthropological way is a culture is anything that's important for a group to believe which includes aesthetics, ethics, wellness, all the things that I'll be talking about with centenarians. Sure. And what happens if you look at a culture, the way that I define it is that culture, the world has infinite possibility for interpretation. Mm -hmm. You can interpret it in, in any way you want. Uh, you have to have the equipment. For example, the human equipment is you can only see things from uh, infrared to ultraviolet, and that's right. it. But that's not the world because a, a, a bee can see the, infra, the uh, ultraviolet. Right. The uh, a snake can see uh, infrared and a vampire uh, can see or can feel sound waves. So first you have to have the equipment. So we have the equipment within that frame, within that range. Then what we do is our culture weaves a fabric around the world and we begin to see the fabric of the world, which affects our biology, affects everything else, because we, we project the reality out there, whether it's mm -hmm. real or not. And then our biology, our psychoneurology responds to it. So, for example, to bring it down to earth, I always try to do that. You have 100 people that love you and you don't believe that you're loved. You're not going to have the oxytocin, the endorphins, the serotonin. You're not going to have any of that. You have 100 people that don't care about you, but you think they love you like centenarians do. And you're going to have all the psychoneurological benefits because it's the belief system rather than the reality out there. Amazing. And that's how they are. One of the causes of health is entertainers. They think that everybody loves them. It's, it's what uh, my mentor, George Solomon, called healthy narcissism. Yeah. <laughs> it's important to have. Well, well, I mean, like in the new age, they talk about love and trust of self. It's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and and but, but what they do, though, is they're not naive. They're not Pollyanna. It's, everything no. is wonderful. But what they do is they, they, they really believe that people love them. And what they do is they make themselves more lovable. But they also keep away the emotional vampires because emotional vampires don't like love. Right. They like uh, misery and they like uh, to bring you down and, uh, and, and they like to make uh, the world something that's very dangerous. So you, you, you by being that way, you, uh, you reject the people that are not going to be good for you. Beautiful, man. Absolutely beautiful. Um, let's, let's break that, though. So from a standpoint of cultures, let's just say indigenous cultures versus Western cultures, why do Western cultures demonize aging so much? Well, part of it is part of it is that biology had to borrow in order to legitimize itself as a science, had to borrow physics, but it borrowed Newtonian physics. So then biology, the Newtonian physics says, Here's entropy. Entropy goes from order to disorder. Mm -hmm. So they have to impose that on biology and say, well, if your brain is 20, it's going to be less orderly than when you're 40. Right. And that's good for machines and for planets, but it's not good for self-organizing living systems. So the entropy, and so medicine had to buy that. They right. ask you your age, and when they, what, were you 40? Well, what do you, are you okay? Well, you're 80. What do you want for 80? That kind of thing. So Complexity theory has a better, better entropy for living systems. Complexity says the entropy of com a complexity would be you go from, from simple to complex. 
And right. that's how it works. Because if you have, again, the brain of a 20 year old and a brain of a 50 year old, the brain of the 50 year old has more neuromaps, more complexity, sure. more ability to abstract. And all those things are important. But then if you impose that on a, on a medical system and medicine is not a science, medicine is, is a technology. That's right. It doesn't have a, a unified theory like, right. like chemistry does. Right. So, but, and and they, they do wonderful things, but at the same time, they impose a system that works reductionistically on dead things, but not on things that are self-organizing. That's absolutely true. And that, and that's part of the problem. So then that the, the more evolved the cultures, the, the more evolved the, the medicine evolved in, in parentheses, of course. So then there's a, a, uh, an obsession with creating youth with external things. Right. And that doesn't work. You can use creams on, or you can do supplements, but what matters is the, the default mode, which is in, in neuroscience, default is, is the goggles used to look at the world when everything quiets. Default mode is what matters. You could eat tofu and use creams and all that kind of thing. And if you have a default mode of fear, that's what your body's going to respond to. Right. So right. what we try to do is we work on the default mode based on the default mode of centenarians, which it works. And at first, as a neuropsychologist, I thought, well, it's got to be genetics. And these people, are, um, they, they have the uh, telomeres and they have this. and that. No, it's, genetics is 20%. Right. 80, and 20. even with twins, with twins, they found that it's 20%. Wow. So there has to be something else. And the something else is what I call the biocultural components, the belief systems that they have, the way they respond to the world. Have they had good lives? Some have had great lives. Some have been in concentration camps. Some have been raped. But independent of that, they have a model of resilience that is very different. And the beauty of this is that all of this can be learned. And it doesn't require supplements. I mean, supplements are great, but it's not about supplements. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to, to further expound on that, essentially these people, again, centenarians, live, you know, the elders living into their 90s, 100s, and even past are, they're programming their cells with beliefs that, Again, they love and trust themselves, but that everyone that they know loves them, you know, unconditionally. So it's 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 a it, it, again they're they're programming their cells uh, to live longer, stronger, in a healthier state because of the way they think or know. Part of it, yeah, part of it. But for example, the the thinking was that telomeres at the end of the uh, chromosomes that are like little caps, sure, and they they keep the the chromosomes from getting mixed up, but also they have to do with the division of cells. Right. And they thought, well, if you have long telomeres, you're going to live long. Live long. If you don't, you're, going to, you're not going to live long. Not true. Well, centenarians have long and short telomeres. Right. That's number one. And number two, telomeres are fed by an enzyme called telom telomerase. Right. And telomerase can be increased by the kinds of things that centenarians do. Right. Love, self-love, all these kind of things. They, they actually trigger the... Um, um, the telomerase uh, enzyme, and that does the work. But you can't look at it reductionistically and say, how can we change and we can give you a supplement so that right. you that, that, that doesn't right. work. Let's get in and use CRISPR and we'll make telomerase. That's right. That's right. It doesn't work because it's a, whole, it's a, a hologram process, a, 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 a kind of a holistic process that goes on that sometimes is beyond our explanation in, in science. And that and that's the that's the idea that you want to be able to look at what works, but what works is not quick fix, and it's not something reductionist that you can go to the go to the heart and do this and everything's fine it's, because it's it's a hologram, right? And right. and the heart the heart for example, is is the portal of love, the portal of love. And and what does that mean? Well, it means that the heart is a an expression of anything that has to do with emotions. And you would think, well, yeah, no, but that that's just uh, uh, cardiology has nothing to say about that. Well, cardiology has a lot to say about that right. because now in Japan, they found what they call the broken heart syndrome, takotsubo. And takotsubo is a word for a, uh, a trap that the, that the Japanese use to catch um, octopus. It, it looks like a, like a little barrel like that. And they catch the octopus and the, the octopus can't get out. When you have that broken heart syndrome, which they can see it, the left ventricle, which pumps the blood, takes the form of, of the takotsubo. And people have cardiac uh, reactions, like as if they're having a heart attack and so right. forth, 
Fortunately, in many cases, these people, uh, within a few weeks, it, it resolves itself without any damage. So there you go. There is a biosymbolic process where the heart, and the heart has 40,000 neurons. So the heart has, has an intelligence of itself. So it's really very biosymbolic, but these, the way to look at it is you have a holism, a bioinformational field, and then you have portals of expression, and the portal of expression is the heart. It's amazing. I mean, as you're saying so much, there's a lot of stuff here uh, to unpack. I mean, I can't, the, the next talking point, though, kind of is segueing into this, which is, is you know, because we're, you're making a lot of spiritual statements, you know, we're talking about the systems, you know, organizational systems is hologram holographic or hologrammatic. Uh, you know, so the ne next point you have is, th does the immune system have morals? But let me ask you like a deeper question, like how do you merge your findings, you know, with, you know, allopathics, you know, reductionist, empirical, observable with, you know, the clear, obvious spiritual undertones or overturns? Like how, how do you really have this conversation? Because to me, this is where this is going. Well, look at science as, as, as what's measurable. Right. And the contemplative path, which includes spirituality, mysticism, the contemplative path, uh, a path is the immeasurable within you. Right. But it's still there. You can't measure a thought, but it's there. You can measure the correlations of a thought, the neural maps and, and the physiology, and all, but you can't measure the thought itself. And that's immeasurable. And that's what contemplatives study, the immeasurable. Oh, right. And it's just as exact a science, but with different parameters of measurement. They don't measure in the sense of, of using instruments, but they know where to go in your journey and they know where to, where they need to guide you as, as, uh, as, as, uh, with the mentors. I had a, a, a Tibetan Lama who was teaching me some methods and we would sit next to each other and I was doing my meditation and then he would say, no, no, don't go there. Don't, don't go there. So how the hell did he know? <laughs> you know? So, so there's, it's, it's a, it's a process there and it, it's a, a realm that you can actually cultivate and you can learn how to replicate. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, fullyoptimizedhealth.com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, speaking of the llama, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I want to go back to that. So the llama is through his contem con contemplative, his inner work, his meditative, his stillness practices has achieved a level of awareness that is, again, metaphysical is what you're essentially saying, that we can't really have a, a reductionist explanation for. Yes, that somehow he's able to connect his bioinformational field with mine and and then be able to to discuss it. Well, another thing, comic books, um, Spider-Man. <laughs> Spider-Man um, supposedly was bitten by a snake, by a, a spider. Right, radioactive and, spider. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and he was in a coma and he comes out of a coma and he has a sixth sense where he can tell danger. And now, and they, they call it um, uh, spidey sense. Guess who's studying that now? The Naval Research right. um, Department. And they're teaching Marines how to cultivate the uh, that spidey sense the inner wisdom yeah it, it, it's super wisdom. conscious wisdom yeah. yeah so so those things are, are coming into science but they can't teach it by um, by measuring your blood work or it, it's not it, it's an it's an intuitive process that is a different kind of intelligence but it's an immeasurable with the tools that we have with uh, Newtonian physics yeah yeah I think I, I think I don't want to rabbit hole and I could rabbit hole with you, but I think Newtonian physics at some point will just go the way, the way of the dodo bird. I mean, there's, there's too much, you know, in the etheric slash contemplative slash spiritual slash whatever you want to call it realm that is becoming more and more uh, apparent, not just apparent, but accepted. I mean, you look at some of the stuff that they're coming out now in, in the quantum entanglement and the mechanics you know, of understanding that kind of consciousness. And it's just mind blowing. And, and as you know, Mario, um, the ancients knew all of this and they passed this information in oral formats to these indigenous people that you study in a lot of ways. So, I mean, it's nothing new to them. Like they say, nothing new under the sun, right? 
Yeah, and, and they maybe didn't know how to explain it with the quantum methods, but the way to look at it is that everything has its function. Right. Newtonian needs to stay above the uh, nucleus. Right. Or above the nuclear. Then if you go beyond that, then you have to go to quantum. And if you go beyond to that, then you have to go to uh, processes of complexity and so forth. So Newtonian is great if you're doing mathematics for a car right. or, or going to the moon and those kind of, that's really right. important. Right. But if you do other things, and for example, Penrose, Penrose, uh, uh, he's uh, the, the living Einstein, yep. ma mathematician, Nobel Prize winner. He believes, and I agree, <laughs> I agree as if I were a <laughs> lot. <laughs> hey, man, I'm putting you up there. <laughs> I agree that mathematics and algorithms cannot be used to explain the mind. Right. And that artificial intelligence will never be able to create a mind. It can, it can mimic, but it can't create the mind because the mind is not amenable to mathematics or right. algorithms. Right. It's closer to complexity. It's closer to quantum. Right. But you have to be careful with quantum. You can't say, well, the, this is a. You have to be real careful so you don't. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of people do that don't know what they're talking about, and they'll say, oh, I'm going to take you into the quantum field. Really? You're Newtonian. How, how are you going to do that? You're going to turn me into some kind of realm and beam me up, Scotty? You know, that doesn't work that way. So, but if you know the two, you know how to respect each one of them. <clears throat> and and what you can do, I, I talked to Brian Green. Brian Green is is a, a professor at, at uh, Columbia University, mathematician, and and he's one of the proponents of, of, of uh, string theory. was supposed to explain sure. everything. And we talked, to him, uh, we talked about this, and he said, look, a lot of these people are just nonsense what they're saying. And I said, well, can you use quantum metaphorically? He said, yes, metaphorically, yes, but not specifically as this is a quantum event because it's not. Mm -hmm. So you can use the immeasurables with quantum metaphors as long as you're not saying, okay, this is particle and this is, this is wave. So it's a way of, of explaining things that can't be explained with uh, conventional uh, reductionistic science. Hold on, I'm writing that down. Measurables with quantum metaphors. Okay, so I had to go off the beaten path with you then to talk about this because I really am interested in your uh, insights. So the AI, you know, transhumanism, however you want to look at it, the metaverse, you know, all this bullshit. Is, can, can we coexist? Can human beings who are attempting to, you know, stay as what I call empowered, sovereign, and free, you know, with spiritual inclinations and, contemplative practices can we coexist with beings that don't want any of that and want to have their consciousness transferred into the cloud yeah because look there 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 are two ways of looking at things as far as uh, knowledge there <clears throat> the people that uh, that are open the scientists the real scientists are open to information and if you can show them something they'll buy it then there are the technicians who who take their technician or their te technicals as a religion right and you cannot argue religion. If you're yeah. a Christian, you're not going to argue to somebody that Christ didn't rise from the dead. Right. So you, those are people that you, you cannot communicate with in a sense of being reasonable. You have to give right. them permission to be who they are and, and, and love them as much as you can. And that's about it. Yeah, you have to be compassionate. Compassionate yeah. way, but, but also don't let them bring their, their, their limitations to you. Right. <laughs> you know, we're, we're not going to be robots. And the reason is this or many reasons, but one is who creates AI? Right. Uh, brains, yeah. living brains. And the brain was was designed to never be complete. Right. So there, what you're putting out is incompleteness. And the more incompleteness, there's a horizon for more incompleteness. And the, the reason that the brain doesn't need an update or, or, or an upgrade like, uh, like my love, my I'd love Apple, but even Apple, needs to have upgrades. Well, we, the last upgrade we, has, what we had was 150,000 years ago. Yeah. Right. And the reason is what I call, what I'm bringing to science, a relational incompleteness. That's why there's no algorithm. Relational incompleteness says that the, 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 the brain or the mind, uh, which is a, 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 a process of the brain, has, has been designed in a way that some things cannot find solution until they go to an unknown future. There's no software for that. Right. No software. You, you could teach algorithms if, if this, if that, but you, the brain says, if everything. 
And then when you go there and you find in the relational incompleteness, you find information, you don't need, you don't need upgrades. And it's set up that way. So you, with AI, my opinion is you, you, it's wonderful. I think it's great. They're doing some great things and they have a vocabulary that's really very impressive. But that relational incompleteness is not going to allow it to complete because it was made to not be complete. Hmm. I mean, so what do you say? I could go so many places with you. So what do you say then? And I know this is your opinion, but this is a Maverick show, remember. <laughs> Uh, what do you say to Richard Dawkins and, you know, these quote unquote, I call them scientists, you know, that are so anti uh, God or so anti creation force, or again, whatever you want to think of as, you know, the ultimate of, of creation or creativity, you know, again, I, source consciousness, divinity, God, whatever you want to call it, you know, the universal consciousness, universal mind, you know, what, what do you, what do you say to those people? I mean, how, how do we, like you said, compassion, we can live together. We have to respect each other's beliefs, but like, why are some people not capable of seeing what you're essentially talking about right now? Well, let's, uh, Richard Dawkins, let's talk about him. He's a, has an impeccable um, academic background, uh, zoologist and um, uh, evolutionary biology and all that. The first thing that I say to him is, I'm so impressed with your religion. Right. Your religion, you have more belief in your religion than, than, than I have in mine. Right. What is your religion? Atheism. It's a religion because you can't prove it with science. It would be a categorical error to take something scientific and try to prove something that's metaphysical. Right. You have no question that there's no God and there's, and there's no, uh, no intelligence. I question it every once in a while. So please teach me your religion so I can be a better Christian. That's be the first thing I would say. <laughs> That's awesome. How many times have you thought about thinking, talking to this guy? I've actually challenged him to a, uh, to a, a debate. And I said, you know, I'll host it. I'll, I'll, I'll make it public and I'll get, you know, Joe Rogan. I'll get whoever I need to get to like get it to bigger places. But let's talk about this. Let's have an open yeah. debate. But he, yeah. he refuses to. So he can he can talk about all of that. And I think it's wonderful. But his cosmology is I'm here and my end is food for the worms. And that's great because he's still a good person and he's still a he's a rational person. And his cosmology is based on that. My cosmology is that you have to have a hell of a lot of faith to believe that we're just here by chance, iterations from biology. Another example, uh, Sam Harris, who's another really oh, great mind. Oh my God, he's the, my mortal enemy. But anyway, he's a yeah. great mind, but he had a- <laughs> That's where it uh, stops, hold on. Great mind. <laughs> <laughs> he had a, uh, a debate with, with Jordan Peterson. Right. So they, they uh, uh, Sam Harris says that we have no free will that were just iterations of our biology. So anyway, before they start, and, and I think Jordan missed a great opportunity. Be before they start, Sam Harris says, and I want to thank everybody here for being here. Thank you for being. It's very nice of you. To I would say, no, 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 no. You can't have it both ways. Right. These people have no free will. They have That's no right. agency. They're here because they're robotic. Why are you going to think, why are you going to think a robot? Right. How the hell is he going to argue that? Right. You have agency or you don't have agency. Right. If you're there, and you're there because some some iterations of biology got you there, then there's no agency. Why would you want to thank someone who had no say in what they're doing? And right. and, and and he's a neuroscientist. I mean, very well trained, UCLA and all that. But still, what they're missing is that uh, you can't just say there's no agency. And let me show you why there's no agency, because it goes nowhere. It goes nowhere. And one of the examples that given is that they do um, uh, some um, tests, some neuroscience tests, that you can actually see neuronal processes going on that are going to go in a particular way before you actually make your decision. Right. And basically they say, well, see, there's no agency. No, those are precursors of agency. Right. So it, it says nothing. Let me ask you a deeper question on this. And I know this is an opinion question, but again, you're a maverick. Are atheists like him, like Dawkins? There's a number, you know, Richard Hutchins. I remember reading Richard Hutchins when I was a kid. God is not great. Uh, is it possible that they are under the influence of something else? Like psycho-spiritually, an, an entity, an energy? 
No, I don't think so, because it'd be very hard to to actually show that. I don't think so. I think these are people that have chosen a a cosmology that uh, that has be uh, that is that is strictly science. They only go with science. And what I say about science is that science to me confirms the contemplative path gives me serenity. Yes. Science has never given me serenity. Right. <laughs> Thinking, 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 knowing, yeah. knowing, knowing. It's that's being. Right. And, and, and another, another thing that's happening with postmodernism, postmodernism basically says everything with Derrida and those people, that, uh, but everything is a, a word game. Nietzsche is a word game. Socrates is a word game. So right. they don't go deep. They right. don't go deep. Right. So they don't go into what needs to be done. And that's why postmodernism is screwing up our right. educational system. Well, I was, so I was just going to ask you that I wanted you, I know we're rabbit holding, but don't worry, we're going to get through everything you want to talk about. But this is very profound stuff that we're talking about because very few people have these conversations. Um, I have 14 year 12 year old daughters. Okay. Uh, so I know what is happening. I, I see the educational systems from, you know, grade school through public and private school all the way up into the university systems now. Uh, you know, where, well, let me ask you a bigger question relative to technology. I have a really good friend who's in Japan. He's 38. He has a, he's a very successful guy. He, uh, he's younger, obviously, than you and I, but uh, he has a very good perspective of the world for his age group. He's a millennial, right on the cusp. But he says that a college degree now, even a master's or a doctoral, is, con is, is uh, contextually relevant to a high school diploma in the early 90s. He said that that is how far you know, education has fallen again, due to technology, due to plagiarism, due to Google and all this nonsense. What, what, what do you see technology play? How, how is technology now, if we can say damaging uh, the ability for younger people to discern and to critically think? Well, I don't, I don't think it's technology. I think it, I think it's philosophies that have been imposed Two okay. philosophies, social constructivism and postmodernism. Okay. Social constructivism, that's it. Eh, there's no biology. Everything's, everything's culture. There are no men or women. You can be whatever you want. Or, that's it. Uh, Postmodernism, it's just a word game. There, there's no moral compass. It's a whatever you want. Right. Those two things, what happens, it, what it does to people, especially young people, is they don't, they don't give them any kind of foundational understanding of who they are or who they want to be. So everything goes on, everything's okay, no moral compass, you can be this, you can be that. There was a woman that was interviewed, a, 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 a supposedly a graduate student, and um, this person when it was asking, okay, a man and a woman are the same, they can be the same? Yes, they can be the same. Can a man get pregnant? Yes, he can get pregnant. Now, that level of stupidity right. requires a lot of time to cultivate, and it comes from the social constructivism that that has come and it's been it, it actually social constructivism uh, Vygotsky and other people talked about it but they didn't talk about it that way they were talking about the cultural components I, I'm a great believer in culture but there's biology you know we have biology and uh, and you have to look at the biology that's going on and I could go on and on with that but suffice it to say that social constructivism and postmodernism are, are the two the two culprits that have made people okay, okay, go, into I go deeper with you. I, I have to go deeper with you. All right. Well, I agree. If you want to, you know, drop it down to that, you know, uh, those two, you know, reasons, but what is behind them? Is there a, again, spiritual, physical, etheric force that's pushing this upon humanity? Because like you said, we have epics and ages and we see, you know, the great hermetic teachers talk about the pendulum always swinging and we go from the age of light and we go to the age of darkness. And again, you know, we could talk about the Piscean ages and the procession of the equinox and all these different things. But is there a malevolent slash chaotically neutral force behind those drives to push people into this? Because it wasn't always this way, Mario. We know that. No, no, uh, no. I, I think, look, there, there, I, I, I believe that there's evil in the world. And there's no question. As a psychologist, I can't psychologize everything. There are evil people. And I worked for a prison system for a maximum security facility. And I saw some evil people. Mm -hmm. And I saw people that didn't need to be there because they weren't evil. But it's, it's just, uh, Einstein said, if, if you can't explain something 
simply in a simple way, you don't know what you're talking about. So I, I'm very careful with that. So I want to make it sure. simple. What's happening is that the two ways of looking at the world, just like you can look at it as a, uh, um, a uh, Dawkins and, and someone else, there are two ways. One is individualism and the other one is collectivism. Okay. Collectivism says we're all the same. We, there's no individuality. And what that does, and it leads people into these kinds of models of education and belief systems, the individual is the one who, and, 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 and what the way that, that people can con be controlled is by creating collectivism, democracy. Democracies lead always to, uh, to um, um, totalitarianism. Republics lead to freedom of the individual. So if you're a collectivist, you're going to want to do things where everything is the same. The collectivists buy into the uh, social uh, constructivism and postmodernism because everybody's the same. Everything's the same. No, everybody's not the same. Everything's not the same. They're smarter people. Some people ask me, are all cultures the same? No, there's some stupid cultures and they're intelligent cultures. Right. The cultures that degrade women are stupid. Right. The cultures that support and, 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 and honor women and men and whatever are, are more evolved. But... Here's the then here's the modern uh, alive and well inquisition. Political correctness. Mm -hmm. Political correctness determines what's acceptable and what's not. And I'll give you an example of uh, some centenarians that I studied in Cuba. There's no political correctness there. And by the way, they get along. <clears throat> so I go to um, a place outside Havana to to talk to this, he was 98 or 99, the centenary, or close to the centenary. And his name, <clears throat> his name was Jose. So I asked, where's Jose? And so oh, just go to the bar up there. And so I go at 10 o'clock in the morning. So I said, okay. So I go look for Jose. And there are a bunch of guys all in their 90s, some of them were centenaries, <clears throat> with a shot of rum. And I thought, these guys are alcoholics. Well, that shot of rum later, I found out, lasted for an hour and a half. Because a shot of rum was an incidental. So anyway, I walk in and I say to this guy, um, where's Jose? He said, that little black guy with the white hair. And I thought, the little black guy with white hair. So I go up to Jose and I said, uh, you're Jose? Yes, I am. He said, so anthropologically, I said, Jose, he said, the little black guy with white hair. How do you see that? And he said, well, am I white or black? Well, you're black. What color is my hair? White. So what's the problem? I said, no, it's no problem. I said, who said that, by the way? He said, that guy with the green shirt said, oh, that's watermelon head. <laughs> so he, then he says, watermelon, come here. And then watermelon comes in. And, and I said, does it bother you to, when they call you watermelon head? He said, look at my head. What does it remind you? Right. And I said, well, now, you, now you've mentioned it. Yeah, it does remind me of a watermelon. Okay, so what's your problem? At the end, they asked me, I said, so what, what's, what's my name here? They said, the dumb psychologist. <laughs> yeah. No political correctness. Where these people are unhappy, the politically correct people are very unhappy. They're always looking for what's wrong and why, how you violated this and you violated that. And that is groupthink. And right. that is the inquisition of political correctness. Yeah. That's I, I, see, I would. It's beautiful, that analogy. I, I, I would say it is like, you know, people that, that. And by the way, I have no political correctness in my life either. I'm a yeah, straight shooter. It's good for your health. I'm highly transparent. I'm highly authentic with people. I literally piss people off because I tell them the truth right to their face. So, I mean, like, I, I get all that, but like, you know, that to me is true reality. Like that's observational. Like, hey, he's got a watermelon head. He just says it. You know, he's not ashamed to, to, to receive it. He's like, yeah, it's cool. If you want to think of me as a watermelon head, I'll come up with something, you know, that's you know, affectionate for you or whoever else. And so, like you said, there's no shame. Yeah, there's no shame you're being identified in a funny way. And of course, if you don't like it, you say, please don't call me water, watermelon head, but, but they, they're okay. They're fine. Yeah, of course. I There's have no a, shame. They don't care about no, that. Of course. A, very, a good friend of mine is a professor. He's a, an African American is a professor at, at one of the top universities. And he said, you know, when I was a kid, I thought it was black. Now I'm an African American. What's, what's going on? <laughs> Are you currently suffering from a testosterone deficiency? Are you already using therapeutic testosterone? If you are, go to tottdecoded.com forward slash 10 dash questions and find out the top 10 questions you need to be asking your doctor about therapeutic testosterone. These are critical questions to ask your doctor. If they can't answer them, you need to find another doctor. 
<laughs> All right. Well, I want to keep going with your stuff. I mean, this is such a beautiful, profound podcast. I'm so grateful that you're here to talk Thank about you. this stuff. But, uh, you know, the four factors of healthy longevity. I mean, there's so many things I could talk to you about. I mean, I know we rabbit hole a little bit, but uh, just to get back to what we want to talk about with, you know, with the wisdom of elders and centenarians and stuff. But uh, what, what are the four factors? Well, what I found was that I kept, as I mentioned earlier, I kept looking for universals. Mm -hmm. They, they, there are a lot of theories. Some of them live close to uh, at the bottom of, of uh, mountains. So there's a lot of minerals. None of that. It wasn't that. It wasn't what they eat. In, uh, in Okinawa, they eat rice and fish. And in Costa Rica, they eat rice and, and meat. So I went beyond that. I said, what the hell is it that these people are doing that's a universal, what I call the, the default modes? And after many years, I found four factors that, that run true. And the four factors, one is aging consciousness how they view aging, growing older versus, versus aging. The other one is time consciousness, how they see time expansion or time compression. I'll, I'll explain them in a minute. The other one is health consciousness, genetic predisposition or genetic sentencing. And the th fourth, which is very important, self-love consciousness, self-significance or self-neglect. If, if you cultivate those four factors, truly cultivate them, you're going to live longer than if you don't, let's put it that way. And so now what we're doing in Poland, and this is what I wanted to tell you, this is kind of the latest stuff. Sure. There's a, a, a world-class longevity center in Poland, and, and they have a place in Germany now, where they're actually looking at biological markers of aging, bo both the biological age and the, the chronological age and the um, biological age. So chronologically, you could be 80. If biologically you're 50, you're 50. Right. Right. Okay. So they're doing all those, all those markers. So what we're doing now is we're correlating the four factors with the biological markers to bring back age. Right. So for example, let's say that you, let, let's look at clinically for a second. Let's say that you come out low on the, uh, on the time consciousness. What that means is that you're living in what I call the urgent present. The you, urgent, you said the urgent present? Urgent present. You don't like have that. any time. You don't have any time. What does that do? That creates a cortisol issue, inflammation issue, which can be measured in methylations and things that they do for uh, epigenetics. Right. We can, we can modify that. We can change that. But here's what happens. Again, gerontology. Gerontology sometimes has a profound ignorance in the way that they look at things because they use the, uh, the entropy. Mm -hmm. Gerontologists will say, hey, look, as you grow older, time's going to pass faster. That's just how it is. So the brain shrinks or they give it all kinds of reductionistic uh, interpretation. It's not that way at all. Centenarians don't have that shrinking of time. Why? Because what shrinks time is a lack of novelty. In the first 30 years, you have the first first of everything. The first love, the first making love, the first divorce, the first bankruptcy. And, and the brain pays a lot of attention to a first. And when it pays a lot of attention to a first, it creates the perception of elongating time. So then what do centenarians do? They keep going from 30 on and they're, they're very, they have a high level of what's called um, 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 the, the type of learning that uh, is curiosity and uh, it's novelty learning. Mm -hmm. They uh, they say, hey, what, what do you have back there? Is that Yoda back there? What, uh, Jay, what do you, uh, constantly. So what it does is the brain creates these concepts. But look how interesting it is. If you are, let's say you're on, on a line waiting to buy some stamps, you're going to think that time is just slowing down. You're so bored. But then when they ask you, how long do you think it took? You always think it took less than it actually did. Sure. When you're in something exciting, you think that time is passing very fast. But when they ask you how long it took, you think it took forever because the brain is storing. And why is it important that it took forever? Because that's what you project to the future. That's so right. you have all the time in the world. Right. So that extremely important. So if you're thinking that time is fashing too fast, is, is moving too fast, you're low on the factor A, on factor B, which is the uh, time conscious. And then there are ways of changing that. The, and one of the ways that I teach people a mantra from Don Quixote, Don Quixote would say to Sancho Panza, the man of La Mancha, he would say when he was helping him put on his armor, Sancho, dress me slowly. I'm in a hurry. Right. And that's a mantra that you use when you're 
when you're compressing time. If you're compressing time, you're compressing biology. And it'll affect the markers. It'll affect uh, gastrointestinal problems, hypertension, cortisol, yeah. um, some uh, visceral fat, all kinds of things related to that. that that's one of them. Wow. The, um, the aging consciousness, it, you, the factor there, if you're high on that factor, it means that you're seeing growing older as a passing of time and you're seeing aging as what you do with time based on what your culture tells you. Mm -hmm. If you see it as growing older, passing of time. If you see it as, okay, the culture tells me that at 40, I have to look like hell, then it'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. You'll dress 40, you'll look 40, and you'll get right. sick like 40. Right. So those are the differences. And, and that has epigenetic correlates that we're looking at now. And we can actually change those things by changing, not just intellectually. You can't say, oh, I'm going to, you got to actually live it. <laughs> you can't say, oh, look, I'm going to change my, you have to actually live it. And there are techniques that we teach how to live it. Uh, methods to, to re- design the brain not program but redesign the brain so that then you can begin to live like centenarians and the question would be why do you want to live why do you want to be live, live that long i've asked a lot of people you want to live to be 100 no why oh, who wants to get sick who wants to be in a nursing right. home right. because that's the mentality that they have that's right that's right but if they look at the centenarians that i look at who die falling off horses and making love well that's a little different and that's the kind of for me why I'm excited about, I wonder what, what's going to happen 50 years from now. Right, exactly. The new when people ask me, I say, I literally, Mario, I say the same thing. And my wife, I'm very blessed. My wife is, you've met Monica. I, I say the same thing. I mean, you know, I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I, I haven't even lived half my life. I'm 50. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. I'm not even at 75. At 75 yeah. is half my life. If you have I, to find the middle. Yeah. Well, if I was going to say, to what you're saying, to get because we're going to go much deeper on this, is I think of the people that, you know, you're just saying, but I think of the people that I've met in my life who are in their forties who define their existence by their condition. Yeah. My but, they don't do any, but they don't do anything to the condition. So I'll give you an example. Uh, 20 years ago, I would do um, some of uh, the, the bench presses. Uh, I mean, that the, the uh, chest presses with machines sure. and I could do 150 pounds. Right. Now I'm doing 200. Yep. So what does that do with aging? It's what you do with it. That's exactly right. That's what you do with it. And and if you say, this is what I'm doing. No, but look, you got to be careful because this and that. and, and da, 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 da. Because again, it's the entropy of you're going to deteriorate. You don't want to be stupid and do things that that uh, run a marathon without a preparation. Right. 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 But you, if you do it gradually, the body has an incredible way of, of learning independent of your age. Right. Resilience. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, so it's, uh, one of my friends, uh, Jason Brashears, he talks about creating an informed field. So, you know, your field, you know, uh, the energy field that you're projecting is like, as you age, you're learning like what you can't do versus like what you, you know, are able to do, which is most things, right? I mean, like, like you said, you go from 150 to 200 and I, you know, I tell people right now that I look better physiologically right now, aesthetically than I've ever looked in my entire life. And I'm 51. Yeah, you know, and it's not like I wasn't training as hard thirty years ago as I am now. I'm actually training less hard. Yeah, but the but reality is, is I program my cells to think and create the being that I am. Yes, and and to your question, the key there is what we call in psychology attribution. Right, attribution. So, for example, you, I always use this example because I've seen it, and and uh, a Porsche is a car for young people. You see beautiful women and good-looking guys advertising it. You see old people with preparation age uh, and, and, and diapers. Okay, so you buy a Porsche and you're 30. You get out of the car, your back hurts a little. Attribution will be, hey, I got to do some stretching because you're 30 and it's okay to have a Porsche. At 70, you have a Porsche. The same thing happens. The attribution and the culture admonition will say, you're too old for that. What are you trying to do? You're trying to be like a teenager here? You go to the doctor. Hey, doctor. I got out of my Porsche and my back was hurting. Well, you're too old for that car. You need a bigger car. And we're going to give you some anti-inflammatory, some pain right. medication, and da, 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 da. Right. Attribution. Attribution. But if you're 70 and you get out of the car 
and you have your portion, you say, oh, I better do some yoga or I better do some right. stretching That's right. or I better do whatever, right. then it's fine. That's it's right. fine. That's right. I, I would actually say that, you know, when I got to make an appointment with my active release technique, uh, tech, uh, massage technician. <laughs> <Tomorrow>. <laughs> Yeah. No, but it's totally true. And that's exactly what it is. There's no limitations. You're not aging yourself with your words, thoughts, and of course, ultimately your actions. I, I, I'm, like I said, that's, you know, part, part of my lecture is that, and it leads into like our last point, but is the learning of illnesses. Um, I, I want you to go as deep as you want to go on this because I really do. It's not even a belief, Mario. It is an absolute knowing that we absolutely do create disease with our thought processes. And then ultimately, like you said, not doing anything uh, to, to co-create or, you know, effectively uh, uh, solve those issues. You know what I mean? We think about them all the time. I mean, you know, I had a profound podcast two weeks ago with uh, Dr. Amanda Vollmer, you know, up in Canada and she, you know, she's a Ivy league trained, uh, you know, academic who was a pediatrician. And now she's kind of out of the system because she's like, it's just insane. You know, she got into it uh, with the people at Harvard about diagnostic testing and what kind of a scam diagnostic testing is right. Because you're yeah. convincing people <clears throat> to go and take these tests that usually are mostly inconclusive, but then, you know, you tell them after, well, you know, like a, an example of a colonoscopy, well, you know, there's a polyp. And they're saying, okay, well, is it cancerous? It's not cancerous, but it could become cancerous. And we recommend you surgically excise it, right? Because that's what surgeons do. That's how they make their money. Yeah. So it's like, it, this is kind of where this goes is like, you know, we create a fear consciousness construct in the, in the patient. And then the patient thinks about it, thinks about it, thinks about it. Once it removed, again, due to many inputs, obviously the physicians are saying, we recommend you take it out. You know, his family is like, oh, you might have a cancerous polyp of your yeah. colon, you know, on and on it goes, but this is kind of where we go with this. And so I would argue, not argue, but just, you know, speak this, that this is how majority of illnesses and diseases are created. Now, granted, there's a lifestyle effect, right? Like epigenetics, you can't be a fat person, you know, not taking care of yourself. You know, you have to eat clean, you have to exercise sleep well, all those things. But by and large, most disease is created from, you know, a mental state and awareness that we create. Well, we, we want to be uh, careful with that so that it, that it, so that that is uh, responsible. There's no question that there's some deterioration as you grow older. There is some, but it's minor. And right. there's no question that you have genetic predispositions. Right. And there are about three or 4% of illnesses that come because there's some gene mistake there and it comes and it's there. There's nothing you can do about it. The other 96% are acquired. Right. And what happens is it's, it's a, an interaction between predisposition of genetics, the belief systems that you have and the environment that you live in and how you teach illnesses to your body. For example, fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia, it's overdiagnosed, by the way. Uh, they call it uh, autoimmune, but it's not so much autoimmune. It's not like the system's not fighting, but but it has some some symptoms that are really bad. There, there, there are nine points that you can have many or all uh, of uh, of pain in different parts of the body. You don't sleep well, right. depression, chronic pain, brain fog, all kinds of things. All right, so you, so you go to a doctor, and they, and there are two camps. One says it doesn't exist; it's in your mind. And the other one says it exists and it can't be cured. They're both wrong. It exists and it can be cured. And here's how you learn it. <clears throat> Every single case that I've seen of fibromyalgia had some kind of early alarm, usually from shaming or something that happened where they had to learn hypervigilance. Right. One example that, that pretty much uh, represents the, the totality. This woman was 42 and she developed um, fibromyalgia uh, around 38. So we start looking and uh, as you know, biocognition is very developmental. You have to go back and where you right. learn. So we go on and uh, were you ever uh, sexually abused? No, no, never. A lot of doctors will just not go there. And you sexually abused? No. I said, no. All right. Did anything happen to you that affected you when you're very little that you knew that something was wrong, but you didn't know that it was wrong and, and it affected you? Said, oh, Okay. When I was about five or six, my grandfather would come in at night and would try to touch me. Oh, Lord. And I would wake up and start crying so that he would go away. 
So functionally, what did she learn? Right. She learned to cry and she learned to be hypervigilant, which means that you don't go into delta sleep. Right. Okay. That's right. functional. Okay. So then you don't go into delta sleep and it will take a few years for that not going into delta sleep, not having enough of the human growth hormones. If you don't sleep in delta very much, you're going to have chronic pain. You're going to have depression because you have chronic pain and all those kind of things. And no amount of medication is going to change that because it was a learned process. And you would ask then, why, why did it take so long? Well, there's a critical mass that goes on. And as long as it's functional, it's okay. But if it's not functional anymore, it, it becomes an illness. And usually these people who learn hypervigilance will look for people that keep them hypervigilant. Right. This woman married a guy that kept her hypervigilant. She couldn't sleep well at night because he would go, get up in the middle of the night and leave the door open. <laughs> because that's the language she spoke, hyper hypervigilant language. Who can I find? You you got okay. Like the tracks okay. like. Yeah, like uh, like the alcoholics. But that's learned. So what do I do with it? I teach him to bring back human growth hormone, not with medication, but what do you do? Any kind of exercise that you do, I use burst training, but any sure. kind of exercise that you do, you do maximum for 90 seconds and then 30 second rest. In the rest, you get human growth hormones. You teach them that to bring them in until they learn how to sleep with serenity, until they learn to set limits with people, until they learn to get out of the hypervigilance with many techniques, contemplative. Right. And the fibromyalgia is gone within a few months. Amazing. I mean, look, I, this is beautiful, profound stuff you're, you're relating here to people. Um, there's almost no medicines or pills or like you said, even supplements. I mean, like when we, when we learn all these different things, you know, and we use science and then we take action, you, you can recreate. You know, you, you, you can literally create a reality opposite of the reality you've been living. But the part, you know, in, in truth, the patient slash the person has to be willing to yes, change. To do the work. Right? Yes. Yeah. They have to do the work, you know, like uh, the, what is it? The AA is uh, when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Some people, it takes them to that place yes. before they're willing to do the work. Yes. And you, and you can't blame the doctors because the doctors may yeah. say, I know many doctors will say, Hey, look, if you do this and this and this, you're gonna you're not gonna need medication. Right. No, no, just give me the sedatives because I'm not gonna I don't have any oh, time right, for right. that. I'm lazy. Oh, so right. it's not just it's not the doctors, it's a combination of things. And the people that don't want the people that want the quick fix, they're not gonna learn anything. They're gonna be on medication for the rest of their lives. That's it. Right. Right. That's exactly right. And then and, and but you know, there's a cultural or societal, you know, construct in that, right? Because we've we've taught the narrative is the easy button you know, the commercials and just, again, everybody is looking for the free lunch. How do I do as little as possible to get the ultimate results? I mean, look, I, I have guys who come to me who just sell their company for 50 or 60 million and, you know, they're 50 years old and they got one foot in the grave uh, metabolically. And they're like, Hey, I want you to give me a 90 day program. I'll pay you whatever you want. And I literally laugh in their face and said, you don't have enough money. You got, you, you could give me 50 million and I still wouldn't be able to help you. It took you 30 years yeah. to look like you did. Yeah. And, and it takes it, the good thing. The good thing <laughs> is, is that it takes less time, but not 90 <laughs> days. But, it it me a 90 day yeah. program, bro. but yeah, you said, look, you said the construct and that's really important. The construct is very mechanical. So when a car breaks, you go to the tires or you go to the ignition or whatever, and you fix it. The body doesn't work that way. Right. So they say, hey, give me this for this. It doesn't work that way. Right. Let's say with, with uh, uh, the uh, Takotsubo um, broken heart, you can give medication for the heart. You can give this, you can give that. But if you don't work through unrequited love, right. it's not going to do a damn thing for you. Right. And is that then why... I can't pronounce that word. You already said it a couple of times. I know it's Japanese, but is that why the understanding of so many spouses die within one year of dying each with, from each other because of a broken heart? Yes. Yes. And that's something that, that I, in this course that I, that I taught for, uh, uh, for um, shift network, which, which is now available in, in awesome. on demand. I want you to promote I, that. Yeah. I talk about that because what, what happens is that, centenarians know how to mourn without dying with a person sure and they know how to get rid of unrequited love without getting sick 
Yes. And you're absolutely right. You look at Johnny Cash and the Bushes and people that very, very closely, and they don't know how to mourn without dying. And sometimes right. sometimes it's okay if you say, okay, I'm done. All right, I'm done. But what happens is that, and here's the key. Here, here are the two simple um, solutions. Easy to say, difficult to do. If you don't want to die with a person that dies, you mourn by celebrating having known them. Mm -hmm. That's how you mourn. If you don't want to get sick with unrequited love, you put faith in your journey. That's right. Those that's two right. things, but you have to cultivate those things. You have to learn those things. Right. And that's the difference. And and the reason that they do that is because, I mean, if they, these centenarians have had, their children have died, their spouses have died, and they're still around. Part of it is because they have some, a little bit of that, that healthy narcissism. But second, they know how to mourn. When my mother died, what I did is my we went, she died at the hospital and she was 97 and she died peacefully. So I said to my my son and my daughter, let's go to her favorite restaurant. Let's let's go celebrate her. Exactly, exactly. It takes the morbidness out of it. Right. You can still you can you can still feel what's healthy mourning, healthy sadness, as opposed to morbid sadness. The psycho psychoterminology is different. Right. Right. I mean, I would add, you know, my spiritual construct, maybe it's a little woo, but when you get to a level of awareness that you are a energy being, you know, vibrating particles, particles, oscillating waves of whatever you want to call it, plasmatic discharge, right? And you have that state of awareness, you recognize that energy is not going to be contracted or destroyed. So if you are technically an infinitely eternal evolving energy being death of the physical body is inevitable, but it's not the end of you. Right. And I mean, we've seen this in movies. You've seen this in a lot of books, you know, the great philosophers and sages, you know, talk about this. I mean, obviously the gurus, the lot, the, the lamas, they, they, ascend, they attend, the, they ascend quote unquote to the light body. Uh, you know, so, I mean, this is a possibility, I think of all human beings in a physical avatar body. So it's like, if you can get that to that level of awareness, you're not in fear of death, Mario. You're not thinking about that. Now, I, I granted, I know this is way beyond the average person, not the average person that watches this show, but the average person in, in, in society. Um, so again, that construct is, you know, not aspired to, you know, I think of religious, I think of Abrahamic religious teachings and going to the grave and, you know, people that go there every year and they mourn and they think about the missing person and stuff. And it's like going back to what you just said, if they weren't mourning and they were celebrating, like instead of going to the grave every year and sitting there and sulking and I miss this person, you would have a party with friends and family who knew them like every year, if you want to do that, right. For your mom or your dad or somebody yeah. who was a wisdom teacher in your family, a sage, like that the Mexicans, would be way more beneficial. Sure. The Mexicans have the day of the dead. The the day of the dead right. They go there and, and that's, that's very healthy. But see, again, it's that cosmology. Right. If you have a cosmology that your food for the worms, your psychoimmunology is going to be different than if you have eternal right. life. Right. Now, could it, be, could it be that you're fooling yourself? That's okay, but your biology is going to be all right. Like exactly Pascal's, right. Uh, Pascal's wager. Pascal Pascal's said, wager. whether God exists or not, it's better to believe that, that God does. It's risk beneficial. <laughs> that's right <laughs> but, so, but, but, but but hold on there's something to what you're just saying about that like i want to aspire to the thought process that the reason that those people think that way and then ultimately provably again measurably observably live this long is because it's true yeah it's true to them and and we can't prove it till we get there right. uh but if let's say that you're doing something that you imagine that's there and it keeps you healthy and happy. Right. right. What the hell's the problem with it? <laughs> exactly. So, so you know what's the problem with it if you believe that? And Hans uh, Wehinger was a um, a German philosopher, and he talked about the as if philosophy. Right. He said right. that we we can't see the whole world. We create premises as if is this and as if that, but our biology, our our evolutionary biology, had to adjust to the as if because that's all we have. Right. 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 That's exactly right. Beautiful, man. All right, let me put your stuff up here. I mean, I'm so grateful. Uh, so if somebody, you know, you can talk a little bit about, and we're not done. I mean, you can go wherever you want with it if we didn't cover anything. But if somebody does want to obviously podcast with you or connect with you, 
is it just best for them to go to biocognitive.com or do you want them to reach out to you via social? Yeah, biocognitive.com. And they can also go to um, my YouTube channel, Dr. Mario Martinez. I have over 200 videos there. I know. I was just looking at that. I was well, like, guys, no. information there. you're putting and, out uh, priority and discipline one day ago. I and have only, things like, four uh, minutes and 38 seconds. Yeah, I, I can go anywhere from, from uh, epigenetic methylation to uh, the mystical path. It's okay. They both Dude, have that a, is absolutely amazing. So are you are you doing is it just, just you personal one-on-one stuff or are you interviewing people? No, I'm still doing a lot of uh, mentoring. And and one of the things that I'm doing now is taking these four factors, because we have a questionnaire that we developed and using them with organizations. Okay. We go to top management and middle management. We we say, okay, forget the vision and mission statement. What is the cultural language that you're living? And we can tell you the culture language that you're living from this questionnaire that we're going to give you. And then we can do biological markers if you want and see if we can reverse those, which I, which, which we can. What test do you use? Because like, I know obviously of true diagnostic and then glycan age is, is, is the, are the glycan age people, the ones uh, affiliated with the Polish research? Yeah. Place? Yeah. Glycan age is pretty good. And yeah, uh, glycan age is good. I have that. I just interviewed the, what's her name? The woman that's the head scientist. from. Oh yes. Yeah, she's a young woman. I can't remember her yeah, name. She's very young. Yeah. I, I haven't, she hasn't, her, hasn't run yet, but she's she, brilliant. She's very good. She's very well. I, yeah, I've talked to her a few times and actually they did the glycan age with me and I came out 21 years younger. I believe so that, that's yeah. pretty good, but yeah, I, 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 just mine good. In, I don't know yet. <laughs> I said mine in last week, so I don't yeah, know. Yet. It, but, well, true diagnostic. It, 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 it's you know, very good. Yeah. True diagnostic. When I took theirs a year and a half ago, I was uh, 27 years younger than I Oh, was. that's really good. That's really good. Yeah, they look at uh, inflammatory markers and they, right. they, they look at one of the antibodies. Uh, I think it's IgG or IgM. I can't remember which one, one of the two. Uh, and it's really very accurate, much better than telomeres. Yeah. And, and then there are others. Of course, they do conventional blood work uh, and cortisol and this and that. And then what we're doing, which will be world class, is for the first time correlating any longevity center, the best, don't have anything like this. They don't have going to the centenarian. So this is what works. And how can we how can we relate this to what we know about uh, genetics and epigenetics? And then how can we have interventions to change that? It's the only place in the world that has this. So it's really I'm very uh, happy that I'm working with them, and uh, and we're really coming up with some good stuff. But I developed the questionnaire. It's called the CCI, um, Centenarian Consciousness Inventory. Wow. Mario, how old are you now these days? I mean, I know you're- You never tell your age. You're chronologically a specific age, but you're biologically 25, but like- yeah, That's right. Bi biological 25. You never tell your age. You know, in Christian Northrop, uh, it's just so funny because anytime anybody asks her age, she said, Mario won't let me tell my age. <laughs> <laughs> I never <laughs> actually asked her. Never, never ask it. You know, when you ask it, uh, and, and, and you have to live that model. When That's you right. ask it, even though I know that it's not a big deal, I have a lot of cultural history baggage that sure. tells me, oh, wait a minute. Oh, I just told my age, boom, boom, boom. And then you got to clean it up. Oh, yeah, the easier way is to say, hey, I'm ageless. And then some people will say, oh, you have a problem with your age? I say, no, you have a problem knowing my age. Right. I'm, I'm ageless. Ask me what I've done in my life and I'll tell you. Uh, it's like people say, what is your pronoun? I don't have a pronoun. I have... Uh, <laughs> values in don't my even life. get me going on that that's right i have values I, I i send emails out about that i'm like well you know you've psychologically you've devolved you've devolved to where you have your pronouns pronouns on your social media <laughs> yeah yeah i, I want to know character not pronouns all right well, well we don't have to talk yeah this is why ne never tell else. it because when you tell it it puts you into that portal and then you have to do some cleanup and i don't want to have to do cleanup so 100 percent, man all right i'll tell you 102 there you go that I knew it would come out eventually. <laughs> well, listen, uh, I have a lot of friends now in Nashville, so I am definitely before the year's over coming back and I'm taking you to dinner. We're going to break bread together. Oh yeah. That'll be great. That'll yeah. hundred percent. That's going to happen because I have a lot of friends that are moving from California now to Nashville. I know it's an amazing place and it you know, is. My, all my family's uh, in Atlanta, you know, North Atlanta. So it's not far anyway. And so they I'm have some great restaurants. It's, it's a gourmet city now. Really, really amazing what they have. Nashville is like, I just saw an article that it's a top four destination in the West now. Like yeah. everybody is relocating there because the cost of living, no state income taxes, you know, very no, no, tax, right. no riots. And it's just a, <laughs> you can own a gun, you know, those kind of things that are right. so 
politically right. incorrect. Right. But you know, they still have that country music thing. So I'm a, I sometimes will have a CD on my work and all that, and I'll, and I'll give it to somebody and say, oh, I didn't know you were a country singer. What, what do you have here? <laughs> no, no, it's not, not, not singing. <laughs> Mario, you're amazing, man. I'm so grateful that you came on here today. This was oh, a my profound pleasure. podcast. Um, again, you guys, uh, for all of the amazing people that watch this, uh, support the great people, the incredible, enlightened human beings that attend and, and show up on the Jay Campbell podcast. It's very, very important. Go to biocognitive.com. You can also find his YouTube channel, which I just subscribed to. I mean, he's got insane stuff there. Um, so you guys, again, please go there, you know, check it out, subscribe to it. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon.